going to round out our study of the epistle of John. Well, the second epistle, I should say. We are living in the last days, and as John was writing these particular epistles, it was perilous times also. There were great people coming into the, the church. Many of them were pretenders. Many of them were, were scoundrels who were coming in to change the church, to change the message, to change the doctrine, to change the foundation. And so John wrote these epistles warning the early church, being the last of all the apostles. Now in his 90s, he wrote these, these epistles to the, the church, telling them that there are going to be perilous times. People are going to come in. They're going to deceive. And so it's in these last days that we are living today that we also are encountering perilous times. We're also encountering, encountering deception. People want to change the doctrines of the church. People want the church to be more up-to-date, more to the, to the situations and the, and the mores and, the, and the, all the different customs of our world today. Beloved, we need to understand that John here is writing us a warning letter that was written to the early church, but is more so needful in our time. There are a lot of unhappy Christians today because of the times in which we live. We live in perilous times. There are a lot of things that make Christians today and non-Christians unhappy. But you know, God has never promised us that our life would be happy all the time. I do not believe that God is under any obligation to make you or I happy. I just don't feel that. Happy is temporary. Happy can be changed in a moment. That nice new car you parked at the mall and that, that guy drives up in the pickup truck with two rubber tires on the back almost falling off and takes that nice car door and slams it into your brand new car, your, your happiness is gone. But you see, God never promised us happiness, but you see, we are to live a life that would Give us the fruit of joy. As Christians, we need to have a completed joy. And the issue, again, isn't our circumstances. The issue is God's presence in our life. And the joy that we have is not joy that we work up. Well, if everything was just going right, God, I'd have joy in my life. Doesn't work that way. Early Christians had joy. That wasn't a perfect life, folks. Many of them were murdered. Many of them were killed in arenas. Many of them were hung up on stakes as tiki torches to make sure the Caesars had their parties at night. Folks, listen to me. Joy is not based on our circumstances. It's based on the fruit of the Spirit of Christ's presence in our life. Today in our text, John is going to explain to the elect lady about this joy. We're going to see in our text in, the, in verses 12 and 13, just two short verses. You can say, how are you going to get a sermon out of this? We're going to find out. Oh, yeah. Trust me. We're going to see two things tonight. We're going to see that fellowship or the joy of fellowship is a matter of desire. You've got to want the joy of Christ. And that fellowship and, and that joy that we seek is a matter of devotion. We've got to work at it. It's not automatic. So let's look at verse 12 and 13 tonight. Having many things to write to you, I did not wish to do so with paper and ink. But I hope to come to you and speak face to face, that our joy may be full. The children of your elect sister greet you. Amen. How in the world can you get anything out of that, Pastor? That's just a closing text of a letter. Don't you, aren't you like me? It's like, man, i got to finish this letter quick. What am I going to say? All right. Then sign my name and it's gone. That's not what the Holy Spirit did. The Holy Spirit put together these, these last two verses for a reason. In verse 12, we see that this joy, this this joy that comes from fellowship, as we're going to see, is going to come from the fellowship of the saints 
that you and I must desire to want it. You know, a person who wants this joy, if they don't work at it, if they don't read their Bible, if they don't come to church, if they don't do good works, if they don't serve, if they do not equip themselves uh, with the gift that God has given them and using that gift to, to further the fruit of the Spirit in their lives, they're not going to experience joy. Joy is not automatic. You don't all of a sudden plug into something and God says, okay, you got joy, bingo, here you go, push button, joy. It's not that way. Look at verse 12 again. The first thing we need to see is we have to have a desire for instruction. Desire for instruction. You see, fellowship in God's word brings joy. I tell you, sometimes when you, when you read God's word, it convicts you. And that's a good purpose for it. Because you see, the conviction helps us to take those parts that are not Jesus-like in our life and discard them. And we become more and more like Jesus. And lo and behold, our joy is increased. Having many things to write you, John writes them. You see, that's a, they have to have an earnest desire to learn the truth. They have to have an earnest desire to know the truth. He says, I have a lot of things I want to write you. And I'm sure if I wrote it, you, you would read it and you would put it to heart and you'd live it. I know that. But John says something different, as we'll see in a moment later. But we see that earnestness to learn the truth is a heart issue, is it not? Why is it that people don't read the Bible? Why is it they don't come to Sunday school? Why is it they don't come to church Sunday night, Wednesday night? Why is it that, that the churches are closing up? I don't know if it's stubbornness or just the fact that I believe we ought to have a Sunday night program, that we continue to have one. It's not that, that we have the abounding people, but the whole bottom line is you're important. I'm important. The presence of God is here. He's important. Why wouldn't we want to come? You have to have an earnest desire to learn the truth. That's a heart revealing the truth. Who we belong to, we are all the same in the aspect that we have the same 24 hours. I've had people all my life, well, I just don't have time to come. What? We have the same 24 hours. Now, I understand there are people who work on Sundays. I understand that. My mother was an every other weekend person. She dealt with the medical field and all of that. And make a long story short, they, they had to have her there every other Sunday. I understand that. Policemen, I understand that. Doctors, I understand all that stuff. But see, here's the issue. Not all of us are in that kind of profession. And I've heard people all my life, that's my only day to sleep in. But the whole bottom line is simple, beloved. You've got to have a heart to do that. So we've got all the 24 hours the same. The answer, or the, the question to this and the answer is easy. Who gets those 24 hours? Do we give them to God? Do we give them to ourselves? Do we give them to Satan? Who do we give them to? Next, we, our heart rouses us. It is our desire that motivates us to live for Christ and to live for others. You ever ask yourself a question, why would anybody want to be a doctor? Oh, they make big money. They drive Mercedes. Folks, that lasts about six months. And then it's the phone calls all night long. And then it's, well, I don't want to be there. I'd like to be that part. I remember bringing my doctor out of a party one time. He had a tux on when he came. I thought, man, this is rather formal, you know. He <laughs> came in and had a party, and then I had, had an accident as a kid, and he had to go to the hospital. I thought, boy, that poor family can't even have a party. And he had to suture me up, you know, the whole nine yards. But the whole bottom line was simple. Who'd want to be that? You've got to have a desire, don't you? I think it's a calling. I think nursing and doctoring and all that kind of, I think those are calling, callings that God gives people. But you see, if you don't have a desire, if your heart doesn't rouse you to learn the truth, you're not going to be here. That's a choice. Paul says here in verse 12, I really have many things to write you. 
And see, there's an eagerness to live the truth also. Not only do you have to be willing to share the truth, and I hope you folks come, and I hope when you come you share the truth of the joy of Christ in your life this last week. I hope next Sunday you've got a great, great testimony to give. Oh, I don't have a testimony preacher. You know, I'm just, just an average person. Yes, you do. Sometimes we forget what God has done in our life. So, so be ready. We see an eagerness to live the truth. You see, our separated direction is simple. Our walk, our work, and our witness is all the facts of what we learn, and it is the joy we experience. And as we share Christ, and as we share with one another, as we walk with Christ, and as we work for Christ, it all shares the same thing, and our joy is complete. Those Bibles, beloved, are going to bring joy to some hearts in the Philippines. Some people have never held a Bible in their hand. Now, before we say, well, yeah, those Philippines way over there in the boonies, they don't have Bibles. I know, Christ, and I know people who aren't Christians here in Fort Wayne have never held a Bible. And I shared with the church many years ago, they're going to start sending missionaries to us, and they already are. I've seen Koreans who have come from Korea to become missionaries to America. Now, I'm telling you that with all my heart to tell you the truth, folks. The bottom line, before we look over there and say, those, those Philippines over there, they're, they're not very godly. The bottom line is there's a lot of godly, good Christian people there. If we'll just but give them the tools, they'll turn those islands upside down for the Lord. Now, here's the bottom line. What joy we have when we share. What joy we have when we give. Our work, our walk, our witness. Psalm 1, 1 said, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scornful. The bottom line is simple, beloved. Who are you walking with? Your walk is going to determine your joy. And so I say, as Paul, or John would say here, you have a desire to be instructed. And you see, there's a saturated desire or delight too. You see, he reads the word, he believes the word, and then he lives the word, and that produces joy. If you look at the word of God and you say, this is God's word, and you read the word of God and you say, this will bring me joy, and it does. And then not only do you read it and the joy comes, but you begin to live it. And then you live the word and you share the word with others and you witness and you send Bibles and you, and you invite people to church. And boy, I tell you, there is no greater joy than to see somebody walk down that aisle that you invited to church to receive Christ. I'm telling you, if you have never experienced that, folks, that's one of the greatest joys ever. And let me say that to you. You're not going to experience that if you don't invite somebody. If we don't invite people to the church, well, they won't come. <laughs> you say, well, I invite them and they don't come. That's okay. That's not your problem. But boy, what a joy to see them when they show up and they sit there and lo and behold, they're underneath the word of God and they come down that aisle and they say, I want Jesus in my heart. Man, there is joy. In heaven, there's joy in your heart. We see the eagerness to live the truth. Our separated direction, our saturated delight, and there's our supreme destiny. Our lives produce fruit for God. Psalm 1, verse 2 says, But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. Verse 3 says, He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. A lot of people don't have joy because, you see, they have no desire for instruction. Next, there's a desire for interaction. Fellowship in God's Word is important. It brings us joy. But fellowship in God's worship also brings us joy. That's why I don't understand people who don't want to go to church. I, I just don't understand that. Well, if I had a perfect time every time I've come to church, well, no, not every time. I've had times in church where I thought, I wish I'd have missed that service. I imagine you felt that way too. <laughs> a 
We see a desire for interaction. See, it's a matter, again, of personal worship. Paul said, or John says here, I hope to come to you. <clears throat> he says, I, I want to write things to you, but I hope to come to you. You see, it's much better to, to see you face to face. My father-in-law used to say, he'd have all these people in his church say, well, you know, preacher, I can't be there Sunday, but I'll be there in spirit. He'd always say, I don't want your ghost there. <laughs> I want you. I can't have fellowship with a ghost. I want to have fellowship with you. So it's a matter of our personal worship. It's a personal covenant. When you join a church, you're saying to the people, I want to get involved with you. I want to share with you. Now, folks, that's not, not everybody can sing. Not everybody can play piano. Not everybody can preach. I understand all of that. But you see, most of the ministry is not done out of a pulpit or out of a, a, a podium. A lot of it's done right there in the, in the pew. A lot of it's done, I'm praying for you, brother. Let me pray for you, sister. A lot of it's giving money to, to help people across the world, sometimes helping people right here in town. Some of you ladies, the things you've been giving, diapers and all that stuff for all the... Listen, folks, that's the joy you have. Don't you feel good about that? Oh, I hate this stuff. I hate bringing these diapers in. I, I hate giving this stuff. Boy, I just hate making people happy. <laughs> Shame on you, right? It's a personal covenant. And then there's a personal commitment. Any relationship requires a commitment of presence. I was clear across the world. It was nice. I received a, a little one of those little tablet things that, that I could look on that little tablet thing and see my wife on the other side of the earth. I could contact her. I talked to her. First time I did it, boy, it was hot that day. It was hot, and I got back in that Man, I cooked that AC up. Boosh, man, it was like a motorboat going off on the on thing. But, man, I was sitting there just sweating, just unbelievable. And my wife looked. I saw her look in her face. She went, you okay? Yeah, I'm just hot. <laughs> you know, couldn't hide much on that. But, oh, what a joy it was. You know, I wish we had that when I was in the service. That would have been nice. All I got was one of those pay phones and a couple of little quarters. I had to go in town to get a roll of quarters from the bank. And then, ba-ding, 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 hello, you know, type of thing. But you know, it's so much more fun when you're in person. It's a greater joy when you, when you see each other. Yeah, sometimes you come with problems and sometimes you come with hurts and sometimes you come with, with issues and we, we've got to pray about it. Listen, folks, if you need somebody to pray for you, don't sit back in your pew and say, well, Lord, you send somebody to pray for me. No, you go to a brother or sister, someone you trust. Now, don't, you don't have to divulge everything. This is not the time where you come and confess everything. Just say, look, would you pray for me? Sometimes we don't even need to know and we pray. So it's a matter of, of personal worship, but it's also a matter of partnership. And he said, I want to come to you and speak face to face. It's a partnership in presence. Goodness, I'm telling you, we could, we could put, you know, why, we could have a worldwide church. We could just put one big old screen up here and a little camera and, and you know, Skype it and just have a Skype church. Man, I mean, we could have people all over the world. All that kind of stuff we, we could do. But what good would that be? I don't want to see images on a screen. Anyway, you know, some of the best times we have in the church, it's time for shaking hands. You know, I see a difference with you. I told uh, Kathy and Dave Salt that the other day when I went to go visit them. I said, you know, one part of the church I would never change, and that would be the handshaking. And she said, why? I said, because the church changes at that point. You all come in, you're tired, you're wore out, you're doing this and this and that. But man, boy, once we start that handshaking, everything changes. Why is that? Because we have a partnership in presence. Interaction requires your presence. Get involved. And then there's the partnership in purpose. It is the purpose of God that we come to church. So what's the result of our desire for instruction and interaction? The Apostle Paul says, or excuse me, the Apostle reveals, John says, that our joy, 
there in verse 12, that our joy may be full. Notice that John said, our joy. It is a twofold joy when we read God's word, when we live it, and when we apply it to God's family and God's house. It's a twofold joy, a joy for others and a joy for ourselves. Everyone wins when we obey God. Everyone. You know, there are people who leave church and say, boy, that was a waste of my time. Well, what tragic would that be? You know, there are people who, churches that are just absolutely tragic places. They don't, they don't give you joy. They don't give you strength. They don't give you encouragement. You know why? Because they don't preach the word. Well, then we see not only fellowship and joy is a matter of our desire. You, ought to, you have to have a desire for it. But you'd also there's a matter of devotion. Look at verse 13. The children of your elect sister greet you. Amen. Now, there's the family of grace. The children of. Now, as a child of God, we are included in the family of God by grace. When I went to the Philippines, it was like I was home. No one ever said to me, oh, there's that, you know crazy guy from America, you know, we'll just let him sit there and blabber around a little bit, and when he's gone, we'll be happy. No, I was a part of the family. I got to sit down. I got to eat with people. They didn't stick me over in a corner by myself. I tell you, a lot of times, one of the, one of the most sweet times is when I sat down. I was sitting down to a next to, to an older gentleman. We were talking for a little bit, and these little kids came over, and they'd take my hand, and they'd put their head on it. At first, it scared me. I didn't know what they were doing. I, I Seriously, I thought, they're going to bite me? You know, I thought, you know, what's going on here? And they did that, and, and it dawned on me what they were doing, and I was told that they're showing respect to you because you're an older person. <laughs> That's kind of like getting your discount at McDonald's, right? But anyway, <laughs> but it was sweet. I wasn't put aside like I was some some weirdo, I was included in the family. When we were down in Brazil, we couldn't speak a word of Portuguese. I, all I had was an um poco espanol. <laughs> and very um poco too. <laughs> the bottom line was they, did, they couldn't speak English, but we had a wonderful time together. It was a sweet time. Why? Because we're family. A child of God is included in the family of God by grace. It is his grace that saves us. Therefore, we are children of God. Remember, beloved, your past. When we realize we're children of God, we need to remember our past. Why? Because we need to remember what we were saved from. What does that mean? Our sins performed were in the past in the aspect that all our sins were forgiven by grace. You say, preacher, you don't know what I did. No, I don't, and I don't need to know, nor do I want to know. That is between you and God, and God has taken it and has forgiven it and has cleansed it and has cast it as far as the east from the west to be remembered no more. I am not your confessor, and neither is anyone else in this room. God has forgiven you. God has blessed you. Oh, think of that. Just ought to make a Baptist shout, shouldn't it? And then there are sins performed and there are sins prevented. Oh, after you got saved. See, I got saved an 11-year-old kid. Some of you got saved later on in life, and that's, that's okay. I'm glad you're saved. I don't care what I had. I, I, I baptized a judge who was 82 years old that got saved at that age, 82. When your sins are, are prevented, this is what it means, that you're saved from what your life could have been. Think of that. As a lost person, what would your life been? What would you have been engaged in? What did God prevent in your life by you receiving Christ? You think of that. Oh, when you remember your past, you have a devotion to God to thank Him for what He's done for Him. And then you relish in your present what we were saved for. Oh, beloved, you're not saved just to walk around like a, like a, 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 a little trophy on the sidebar over here. But in reality, we see here we are saved to give glory to Christ. 
1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. You know, I can't do anything for God or I don't, I, I don't have any gifts or skills. Listen, can you drink? Yes. Can, can, you, can you, whatever you do, the Bible says, you can drink, you can eat, do it all for the glory of God. Find something to do to give glory to God about it. Well, how can I eat and drink and give glory to God? It's simple, folks. Some of you ladies go down to that ladies shelter down there. And you serve food to them. And you give drinks to them. Oh, that's glory to God. And you bring Bibles to them. That's glory to God. And then we give grace to others. Oh, beloved, Galatians 6.10 says, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. Oh, don't sit around and think, what can I do at the church? Sit around and think what I can do every day for Christ. Oh, beloved, you ought to be able to do all that you do everywhere you do it. At work. Some of you go to school, do it at school. And then not only do we remember our past and we relish in our present, but we rejoice in our future. And what is that, preacher? Well, we see the what we were saved to become. We see what we were saved from. We see what we were saved for. Now we're going to see what we're saved to become. See, we're going to see Jesus. You know, I, I love the fact that Betty Edwards was, was conscious almost all the way to the end because Betty was, had a great testimony. And she said, I, I told her, I said, well, who are you looking forward to seeing, Betty? She goes, I'm going to tell everybody, step aside. I want to see my Jesus. She said, that's who I want to see, and then I'll see everybody else. But let, let me say, we're going to see Jesus one day, the one who saved you, the one who loved you, the one who died for you. And then we're going to serve Jesus. Well, how are we going to do that in heaven? How can we do that? No, you're going to serve him not only in heaven, but you're going to serve him on the earth and the new earth to come, the new heaven and the new earth. We're going to serve him. Turn a little bit to the left of 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. We'll start with verse 6. Paul is writing here. That's why I keep thinking Paul. It's John who wrote the, the second epistle of John. And it's, but I keep saying Paul, but this is Paul's writing here in 2 Timothy. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering. And the time of my departure is at hand. He's not leaving. He's dying, going to die. Verse 7, I have fought the good fight, and I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Folks, we're not going to just go up there and say, well, thank you, Jesus, and then walk around bored to death. We're going to have rewards. We're going to have great gifts given to us. Last Monday, I stopped by and I saw Michael Bobilia, who passed away. And as I sat down with him, I said, how are you doing, Michael? And he says, it feels like combat. And as I heard that, I thought that where Paul says, I fought the good fight. You know, life is that way, folks. Life is not just something you skip through. Life is just not just something where you just kind of just like you're floating on a little inner tube going down the stream. There's only one stream in Florida that you can do that with without worrying about what's inside the water to eat you. And it's because the water is so cold, no alligator will grow in it, grow, uh, crawl in it. And you can just get in that inner tube and not even worry about a gator at all and just kind of float down that little that river there and just kind of have a great time. And some people have little cup holders on their little inner tubes and they just kind of go on down the road down the old stream and man it just is a wonderful thing you don't do that in every place in Florida trust me but let me say this to you beloved life is not a float down the stream it's a battle 
It's a fight. It feels like combat. Your joy, if it's based on your circumstances, if your joy is based on your work, your home, your family, your children, your church, all these things can be taken from us. Not only in times of disaster, but also even in death. Well, we rejoice in our future. We've got a great future ahead of us. And then we see finally not only the family of grace, but we see the family of God. He says here, the children of your elect sister. That's another church. That's another congregation. He says here, I want you to be faithful. He said that the children of the elect church greet you. They're being faithful. Be faithful to God's people, his church. Be faithful to the things of God and God's people. Turn to Hebrews. We'll follow this all the way out. Hebrews chapter 10. A little bit to your left. Hebrews chapter 10. Most of you are used to hearing or reading the 25th chapter. But let's look what Hebrews, the 10th chapter coming up to that means. In Hebrews 10 verse 23... The Bible shows us that we are to encourage one another with a godly witness. He said, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Hold fast to what you believe. Hold fast to what you know. Hold fast to the hope you have in Christ, for he is faithful. And then we see in verse 24, encouraging godly works. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Oh, beloved, church isn't a place where you stir up people to get angry. Church is not a place where you stir up people to punch people. Listen, I've heard of churches like that where they breaking out, broke out in a, a fight. There was a church in this town where one of the deacons met one of the church members out in the parking lot with a pulled gun. No, not this church. <laughs> Folks, I'm telling you, that's not the way church ought to be. The Bible says here in verse 24, we ought to stir up love and good works. Oh, we ought to encourage each other to do great works. Well, here in the church, yeah, here in the church, but everywhere you go, you ought to stir up good works in a place where you work and where you go and the place where you, you, you shop. My wife talks to everybody. My whole, all my children know that because they don't want to go shopping with her because she takes so much time talking to everybody. But you know what? Some of the times when she talks is for a purpose. And many times she finds out if they're Christians or not. Most of the time she does. But you see, that's godly works. You never know when you're going to meet somebody out there tomorrow that you're going to need to pray for, that they're going to need somebody to pray for them. They're not going to tell you my family's falling apart. They're not going to tell you my life is upside down. They're not going to tell you all this stuff. But you know what? You might just say something like this to them. What can I, do you have something I can pray about? You know, our church has a Wednesday night prayer service. Maybe there's something we could, I could take the church and have our church pray for you. My friend down in Florida, bless his heart, he was scared to death about his upcoming uh, heart cath. Scared to death. And I told him, I said, church is praying for you. He said, oh, you don't know how much, how comforting that is to me. Beloved, listen, we have a purpose. Be faithful, encouraging godly witness and godly works. Look at verse 25. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. That word day in my Bible is capitalized. Is it capitalized in yours? It's not talking about just Sunday. It's talking about the day that Jesus returns. In the last days, the Bible says that we ought to come together more often as we can and encourage each other. You know why? Because in the last days, there's not going to be any of that. There's going to be a lot of people not going to church. The Bible says the falling away. I see that there and there. It says, but... Do not forsake. Well, we shouldn't forsake. Why? Because there will be those who will forsake. 
in that last day as it is approaching. We need to encourage one another. Why? Because we're not going to get much encouragement. You're not going to get encouragement from the Internet. Not most of it, I'll say. Or TV, goodness gracious. Your own team can't even win anymore. <laughs> Verse 25 tells us that we ought to be waiting for God. And how do we wait for God? By encouraging others to wait. And then we're to be not only faithful, but we're to be fruitful to God's purpose to bear fruit. We bear fruit internally in that we show the fruit of the Spirit. You know, there are gifts to give, and, and, and <clears throat> there are gifts that God gives us, and those gifts are important. There's people in this room that have gifts that I do not have. And I may have a gift you do not have. That doesn't make me better than you or you better than me. But what that means is we have a responsibility to share that gift, to share the gifts that God has given us so that we can encourage one another. So when you come, you, you bear fruit internally. I mean, externally, you have, that, you have that fruit that you can use to help others, but you also bear fruit uh, internally in the aspect of the fruit of the Spirit. Grow in Jesus. As a pastor, it's my responsibility to help you grow in Jesus, to develop that love and that joy and that peace and that patience and that long-suffering, that meekness, mildness, temperance. And I love the way it says, again, such there's no law. Nobody has to stand around, Moody says. You don't have to have a police corner, a policeman on every corner to make sure you do it. Live for Jesus. Bear fruit. And then also bear fruit externally. Witness to others about Christ. Well, I don't know how to do that. That's simple. Just give out a track. Just give out a track. I'm telling you, it works. I've shared tracks with people who I thought would never get saved, but they did. Folks, I'm telling you, God will use that track to bring people to Christ. You say, well, I don't know if I give it to you. Well, leave it on a table, for goodness sake. My dad used to leave them in the bathrooms of his work. I said, Dad, that's kind of rude. He says, well, no. He says, people need something to read. I said, okay. So he did. And you know what? He led people to the Lord that way. You say, well, I can't do anything with the Lord. Baloney. My dad stuttered. He was scared to death. When we first started out, he was scared to death to talk to anybody because he'd stuttered. But you know, the bottom line was he learned to overcome that. Tell others about Christ. And then what is the conclusion of all of this? Why is this happening back in, in the Second John? That our joy, in verse 12, may be full. That our joy may be full. See, you, you say, oh, I don't have any joy. There's a reason. <laughs> you need to get busy. You will never know the fullness of God's joy in a life outside of His will. His will, His will is the fellowship in the church. Bear fruit. Why do you expect the joy of God's perfect will when you live in God's permissive will? I don't understand that. People do that. But that is the truth. The joy, you want the joy then you're going to have to live the joy. You're going to have to find that fullness of joy in the fellowshipping of believers and then the bearing of fruit. Paul or John here writes again to the lady, the, the elect lady, and then her elect sister. All of these people were joyous Christians in fellowship with one another. Oh, well, one day, wouldn't it be sweet to say, oh, Coventry Baptist Church, I heard about you. Wouldn't it be sweet when well, the angels say, you were one member of that church? I heard about you. See, Satan knows about our church. But the question is, does the Lord know about our church? And that's what the issue is, isn't it? Our joy is not based on our circumstances. It's based on the presence of God in our life and how we serve Him and how we provide for it. Let's pray. Hi, my name is John Blair, and I have the privilege of being the pastor here at Coventry Baptist Church in Fort Wayne, Indiana. I want to thank you for choosing to take part in our online services. I sincerely hope they were a blessing to you, and I want to invite you to continue to use them in the weeks yet ahead. 
In fact, take your time on our website, check it out, let us know what you think about it. Your opinion is very important to us, and we'd like to have some feedback. Let me take this time to also extend an invitation to you. If you don't already have a church home, let me invite you to come to our church and take part in one of our weekly services. Our morning worship service on Sunday is at 10 a.m. Our Sunday night service is at 6 p.m. And our Wednesday services and our midweek service is at 7 o'clock p.m. We're located at 10926 Aboit Center Road. We're right across the street from Homestead High School. Uh, just get on our website. We have a detailed map and some instructions on how to get here. Again, thank you for choosing our website and our services. I pray that the Lord will bless you and keep you. I hope to see you this Sunday. Bless be the tie that binds our hearts in